model railways. Not just any model railways, but some rather special ones. The 1996 exhibition of the Scale 4 Society included a selection of layouts to P4 standards, all hand-built to a scale of four millimeters to the foot. They represented one aspect of fine-scale railway modeling, true engineering in miniature. But Scale Forum 96 was special in another way. It celebrated 20 years of the Scale 4 Society in promoting P4 standards. Arising from work by the Model Railway Study Group, the last 20 years have seen steady and effective development of components and assemblies that enable the most superb models to be made. The results, as well as the kits and components, were demonstrated at Scale Forum 96. As in previous years, the event was attended by a large number of enthusiasts waiting to get in as soon as the doors opened at 10.30. Many return year after year to enjoy a full day meeting old friends and to make new ones. They soon disperse to view the layouts, watch the fascinating skills of the demonstrators or spend money at the various trade stands. Within the society are groups of members which gather in various areas of the country. One such is the North London Group, who built the Bodmin layout. This is a true scale model of what was the Cornwall terminus of the Great Western Line from Bodmin Road, and which included a London and South Western branch to Boscan. The Great Western obtained running rights over this branch as far as Wadebridge. The Great Western always regarded the two lines as one continuous branch so that their trains had to reverse at Bodmin in order to complete their journey. An important feature of Bodmin traffic was the carriage of China clay from the many workings in the Boscan area. The loads were taken via Bodmin Road down to Par for shipment by sea. This, of course, entailed balance workings of empties in the opposite direction. A complete fleet of wagons was built by members of the North London Group to represent this traffic. For a branch line, it was very busy. Two sets of passenger stock and three locomotives were kept hard at work all day. Between the two world wars, more than 40 trains are shown in the timetable, giving 60 or so arrivals and departures. The layout is a true model of Bodmin in all respects to a scale of four millimeters to the foot. In particular, the track and wheels are to P4 standards using, in the main, components and materials obtained from the society stores.
Bradwell is the P4 layout of the Manchester Model Railway Society, many of whom are members of the Scale 4 Society. It represents a fictitious location somewhere in West Yorkshire in the 1950s to 1960s, during the transition from steam to diesel power. Starting life as a test track to try out their models, it developed to become a relatively busy branch terminus at the edge of a town in the Pennines. As with many model railways, the format is a station and goods yard linked to an off-scene traverser to which trains are sent and from which they are returned. All track is made using ply sleepers with rivets to which the rail is soldered, cosmetic chairs being added. Alex Jackson couplings originated and developed by the Manchester Model Railway Society are fitted to all stock. All layouts at Scale Forum at first sight appear to be the same size as OO. This is true in that coaches, wagons, locomotives and buildings are built to a scale of four millimeters to the foot. The important difference lies in the track and wheels. The track on the left is OO with a gauge of 16.5 millimeters, but that on the right is P4 with a gauge of 18.83 millimeters. That is a four millimeter scale version of the prototype. The difference in width together with wheels of scale profile is obvious. Many modelers working to P4 build their own track from scratch, but one supplier offers ready-made track using molded plastic sleepers and chairs. The appearance is very good and it can be bent to form curves. Making your own track is quite straightforward 
giving the necessary jigs, gauges and an appropriate selection of tools and materials. The ply sleepers are first stained by popping them into a container of dilute wood stain. After drying, brass rivets are inserted in the pre-punched holes and secured by either hitting them gently with a small hammer or using a riveting tool. The rivets are then cleaned up and tinned. It is convenient to use a jig to hold the sleepers as shown here. Then a length of rail is soldered to the heads of the rivets. In this demonstration, the rail is soldered to only some of the rivets, the other positions being secured by plastic chairs. Some builders prefer to solder the rail to all the rivet positions and then add cosmetic chairs later. For curve track, the single rail with sleepers is lifted from the jig, curved to the desired shape, and the second rail is fixed. Whether making straight or curved lengths, the second rail is held in position by using the jigs available from stores. Turnouts are constructed using a similar process. A paper template shows exactly where to position sleepers which are secured to the template with double-sided adhesive tape. Ray Hammond's railway is different. It models a long length of double track on a gentle curve with a station and sidings. Other than railway buildings, it is bare of the usual houses, pubs, factories, etc., found on many layouts. In this, it is a real representation of a main line carrying traffic to and from the Norfolk coast, passing through empty countryside. A typical Midland and Great Northern Line station was often over a mile from the village it purported to serve. There are plenty of trains, full goods workings in one direction and empties returning. Passenger trains to and from the Midland and LMS areas, in addition to others linking with the LNER main line at Peterborough. Again, the layout features fully interlock signals and point work, so that once a train is correctly signalled, the driver can proceed with total confidence that he has the road. Just watch the realistic movement of this signal arm, including bounce. Middle Peak is something quite different and intriguing. At first glance, you would be excused for thinking this layout to be a slice of the 19th century in model form. But a closer look reveals that this is the Cromford and High Peak Railway as in the early 1960s. The High Peak was one of the anachronisms of our industrial heritage, a railway born at the end of the Canal Age. It crossed the Peak District in Derbyshire with long level sections that hugged the contours, separated by inclines operated by stationary steam engines. Leaving the yard at a steady gradient of one in eight, Middle Peak incline stretches upwards into the trees. Wagons are hauled up by, in the prototype, a wire rope, which is represented on the model by a fine chain. At the top, in the small goods yard, the wagons are detached to be shunted by another locomotive for their onward journey. This model is the culmination of over 20 years' research into this fascinating railway. The wharf is inspired by Cromford Wharf, the inclined top by Middleton Top, while all the buildings and rolling stop are faithful copies of the Cromford and High Peak originals. Building wagons and coaches is one thing. Locomotives can be rather more tricky. One approach and an easy way to start is to buy a ready-to-run model 
remove the OO wheels and substitute P4 wheels. This Great Western Prairie is one example. The loco was stripped down, the original wheel sets removed, then P4 wheels and axles were fitted. A fine selection of kits, usually in brass and nickel silver, are available from several suppliers. Some require the additional purchase of wheel sets and a motor. They take a good many hours to build with the application of skills such as bending thin metal and soldering. Nevertheless, they result in very fine, good running models with the added satisfaction of achievement in miniature engineering. This Great Western Grange, not yet quite finished, is built from a Malcolm Mitchell kit painted and lined by John Dobson. The kit even includes parts for the back head in the cab. The underside shows the fine scale wheels, brake gear, and the fine phosphor bronze wire pickups bearing on the wheel flanges. At scale forum 96, at a oil junction is the odd man out. First, it's big, taking more floor space than any other layout at this exhibition. Second, it offers a continuous run, with trains able to go round through the fiddle yard at the rear without stopping. Third, it models the Irish five foot three inch gauge, but still to P4 standards. Its origins lie in some stock constructed to Irish gauge before P4 four parts were on the market. The real Adavoyle was a lonely outpost on the mountainous cross-border section of the Great Northern Main Line about midway between Dublin and Belfast. The model presupposes an improbably bustling junction at this site, giving two imaginary branches, northwest to Monaghan and southeast to Greenore. The latter would be the packet port of the Dundalk, Newry and Greenore Railway, owned by the London and North Western Railway, where trains in LNWR livery continued until closure in 1951. <coughs> Tony Miles says, the aim of the original Adavoyle, a quarter of a century ago, was to demonstrate that P4 standards, despite their shallow flanges, could be used on the grand scale. Adder oil was probably the first layout on which express trains charged confidently over complicated point work at Hornby speeds. There was nothing sedate about the progress of the Dublin Express. The Irish Great Northern, with its blue locomotives and mahogany coaches, was a happy choice in that it always had the air of an English pre-grouping railway set in Ireland. This picture somehow survived until as late as 1958. There are some unusual features on Adavoil Junction. There are its odd gauges. It is complex in that nearly 70 turnouts are activated by ex-post office relays conveniently placed below the buildings on top of the baseboards. For the track, rail was soldered to the rivet set in plywood sleepers then chairs were moulded in situ using ingenious tools made by Martin Wynne. Uncoupling dispenses with under-track magnets, but most Jackson fitted stock may be uncoupled at will anywhere on the layout. Mike Sharman and his wife Hilary have been associated with model railways for a fair number of years. Mike was one of the first to offer a complete range of wheels to P4 standards on a commercial basis, but has now disposed of that business for others to run. More recently, he has devoted his extraordinary skills to making models. The result is Credibility Gap, 
named presumably because the results are incredible. The locomotives cover many experimental types such as the Cramptons, condensing engines, Britain's first eight coupled, the first four cylinder and many more. They originate from France, Belgium, Spain, Germany, Austria and Ireland as well as some of our own more ancient types. The model makes no attempt to represent any particular location, that would be impossible. Instead, its sole purpose is to provide a stage to display the collection of models of steam locomotives We had the old um, Bogsworth Junction that's been around since year dot in EM gauge and been converted and we had a harbour at the other end on the same format in an L shape and this all went into a little mini metro with the seats out and that's how we started off with the, the P4 exhibit that went for several years and then I wanted to build alternate stations so that we could ring the changes for different exhibitions and this is the state we've reached now where credibility gap replaced the Bogsworth end and the bottom end as we call it down here um, has now replaced or can be used alternatively with the harbour end and because we've got umpteen different railways represented on the locomotives we have also with the yard cranes, the fittings we've simply taken examples of the Victorian architecture to put on and the railway itself then is meant to be operated for the public um, with made up trains and we simply rotate the locomotives, um, drive the train in, put one on the other end, turn it and go through the normal routine. But there's no shunting, I mean there's no goods trains, we simply haven't built a goods yard. So it is simply as a display case for the locomotives. To get rolling stock, it is possible to buy ready-to-run wagons or coaches and change the wheels to P4. Those who want something to a higher standard, or who need a more unusual model, have a choice from a large array of kits. Taking coaches as an example, there are many traders who offer all manner of kits to satisfy the most particular of modelers. Brass is the usual medium, in which the parts are etched out from a thin sheet. So the first action is to remove the part to be worked on either by cutting it out with shears or by a knife against a hard surface. It is usually then necessary to remove tabs and clean up the surface ready for soldering. Here the buffer beam for a coach comes in two layers. They are joined together using resistant soldering the parts being held by a magnet on a steel base. The buffer beam is then mated to the coach by first a flying flux. Then with a small amount of solder on the iron, one end is tacked, then the other end. If all is correct and square, more solder can then be run along to complete the joint. So gradually and carefully parts removed from the brass fret are built up to form the complete coach structure. There are of course other intermediate steps such as making the bogies or attending to interior detail in order to complete the whole job. This is the last public showing of Winchester Chesil as an exhibition. 
it is already offered for sale to anyone who might have the room to erect it. The Southampton Group have already started on their new layout, Southwark Bridge, which was shown in embryo form at Scale Forum 95. We have here the model of Winchester Chessel, which is uh, the final station on the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton Railway, uh, set in about 1925. And uh, the interesting feature for us is that it was the site chosen, for reasons unknown, by the Great Western Railway to install the experimental route selection system. And uh, we've modelled that route selection system, whereby only the signal levers are pulled off, and assuming the route is OK, and that the turnouts all operate, and then, and only then, will the signals come off. We've actually modelled that, and uh, it, in fact it does actually work in practice. If we've had any failures, then the signalling immediately is locked, and uh, we've been able to diagnose what the problem is. So, even in model form it works. The layout was started about 14 years ago by a small group of people, and over the years has varied, maximum about six or seven people, but often only three or four working on it. And today it's finished, in inverted commas, and, and it's, it's as you see it, um, but it's reached the end of its working life now. And uh, this, is, this is the end for us, for this particular railway. Although we think it might have gone to a happy home. Flintfield comes from the Netherlands. Vincent de Bode and his friends have amazingly modelled a fictitious scene in East Anglia. The name is taken from a farm called Flintfield in the neighbourhood of Eye. The track plan is based on Eye, as are most of the buildings, and the period is about 1920. No conventional baseboards are used in the construction. Instead, a supporting frame made from plywood box beams is used. It supports the layout over its full length and about half its width. It is split in the middle for transportation. Only the track is attached to the box beam. Scenic boards are hooked onto it fore and aft in jigsaw fashion. Backdrop, proscenium arch and lighting are attached to another box beam which rests on two legs of the supporting frame. Track is ready-made plastic based from C&L with a few rivets added on important places. 
Turnouts are operated by old Dutch post office relays. Great help was provided by Dave Doe, who was able to contribute information on the Great Eastern System. He also made the signals with the bouncing mechanism which gives the authentic movement as seen on the prototype. Flintfield is one of the best models of English countryside, and that from Dutch Scale 4 members. Scale Forum offers, in addition to wonderful layouts, a veritable storehouse of kits, tools and materials. Almost 50 traders who are able to provide virtually anything required by the discerning modeler. Small parts for rolling stock, wheels and loco kits, scenic materials, paint brushes, fluxes and cutting mats, modeling paints, books and magazines. There is no doubt about it, Pulborough is vast. Since being extended in the last couple of years, it now occupies some 50 feet in length. Its setting is rural West Sussex on the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway double track main line from Horsham to Ford Junction. It represents the station at its peak in the years around 1910. At that time, the station was provided with extensive facilities, up and down side goods, yards, cattle pens, and coal stays, a loop platform for the Midhurst branch, and loco churning and coaling facilities. The line saw a great variety of stock. There were coal and cattle trains, horse box specials, branch trains, as well as main line and royal trains en route to Portsmouth. The model is a full-scale replica of nearly half a mile of track intended in part to demonstrate the space needed for a large station as well as the enormous size of some of the engineering works, the cutting for example. The track plan is based on a 40 foot to 1 inch plan provided by British Rail. Buildings are based either on up-to-date surveys where the structures still exist or on historical photographs where no traces remain on the ground. The line is now a very busy computer line, but sadly little is left of the original, apart from the enormous station building the canopy and waiting room, and the signal box. The layout comprises a central section 30 feet long. Ten road fiddle yards are provided at each end. Track work is a mixture of hand-built turnouts using ply and rivet sleepers, and proprietary track, all to P4 standards. 
Pfluger X drive units operate turnouts and signals. Construction and installation of fully operating signals, including working ground signals, is now complete. The line features some extraordinarily tall signals, particularly the up home bracket and the up and advanced starters. Scenically, much use is made of dyed lint for grass with woodland scenics material for scrub and for leaves on wire-wound trees. The section of the River Arran features a model of the last surviving Arran barge, which won the Chairman's Cup at Scale Forum 1995. Locomotives are all scratch-built from nickel, silver and brass. The chassis incorporate full compensation and split axle pickup. Most recent locos are powered by Porter's caps, while older engines use Anchorage D11s and D13s. A mixture of controllers are used, including pen trollers and AMR units. Rolling stock features a variety of kit and scratch built items. Coaches are mainly Roxy branch lines and blacksmith kits. Much of the freight stock is scratch built with a few kits from a range of manufacturers. A number of Charlie Traces prize winning wagons can be seen and consideration is being given to the installation of Alex Jackson couplings on some stock. All in all, a wonderful and watchable layout, which was voted the best overall for the Ken York Trophy. And here is the presentation by Society Chairman Mike Peacecod. And so ends a record of Scale Forum 96. For those who came, we hope you had a wonderful time. For those who could not make it, do come in 1997. Leatherhead Leisure Centre, September 27th and 28th, 1997.